Greetings, mortals. Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, executioner, and sweet Lucifer, here we go again. Another religion-themed musical. How do these things keep ending up on my case list? I swear the other side is doing this to me on purpose. You get a little drunk, participate in one lousy rebellion, and you never hear the end of it. It's not like all musicals with religious themes are bad. Some of them can be moving, provocative, even just entertaining. In fact, this 2004 stage production based on a French musical by Elie Choraqui not only shares source material with one of the better examples of the breed, it shares the same star as well. So, what separates the wheat from the chaff, to borrow a phrase from the opposition's playbook? I think it has something to do with the fact that the better musicals are not afraid to be, well, a little irreverent. Even when the overall approach is serious, there's always some lighter moments to offset the portentous events. Jesus Christ Superstar has Herod's song, Prince of Egypt has the court magicians, and so forth. They're not afraid to have a little fun because they're not intimidated by the weight of the subject. In contrast, The Ten Commandments is so determined to be a serious epic musical about serious epic events that it barely cracks a smile, for fear of not being taken seriously. Which just encourages someone like me to come and rip it apart. So let's examine the case of The Ten Commandments. Accompanied by some cheap video effects, Yeah, I know, I shouldn't talk. We get the Exodus for Dummies opening. The Israelite people are in Egypt, they're enslaved and oppressed, and the pharaoh Seti is a bit worried by their tendency to breed like rabbits. To this threat I will not turn a blind eye. The newborn son of each Hebrew family must die. 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 Oh, this must be the Seti Mega Remix version. The bad post-production effects are sin number one. Look, this is a recording of a live stage performance. It's okay to show the production as is. There's no need to dress it up with fancy effects afterwards. Especially when the fancy effects are as badly rendered as these are. Putting a patch of CGI water on the stage isn't going to convince people we're suddenly on the banks of the mighty Nile. On the contrary, it interferes with the suspension of disbelief which would allow our imaginations to supply what the limitations of the stage cannot. In particular, Seti, and for a short while his son Ramses, has this aura added around him that's very distracting. Not to mention contradictory to the story's purpose. Sure, the Egyptians thought their kings were gods, but the whole point of Exodus is that they're not gods and can't handle it when the real deal comes calling. Also, why you would give this saintly glow to a guy who tells his soldiers to throw babies into the river is beyond me. Yeah, about that. The opening showing the slaughter of the Israelites' children, a.k.a. sin number two. I was sorely tempted to make this scene a saving grace because it's worth watching as a treasure trove of unintentional humor. And it keeps getting funnier every single time I see it! But as a serious depiction of the Hebrews' plight, it fails utterly. Let's begin with the music selection for this scene of horrific violence and despair. <laughs> Nothing says genocide like a funky R&B riff. The histrionic pantomime has the wrong effect, and it's made worse by how they handle the fake baby props like they're passing around a football. She's at the 35, fumble at the 30-yard line by Rivka. Dejdi picks it up, but he gets a knife at the throat and the baby's loose and it's picked up by Elohim. He could go all the way! As the Egyptians chuck the Betsy Wetsies into the Nile, Moses' mother, Yokoved, puts her child in a basket and floats him downstage right to the waiting arms of the Princess Bithia. The two women sing a touching duet accompanied by the ancient sounds of a soft rock drum kit. I need it now. Can I surrender everything? It's more than I have a dream. I need it now. How can I let go of all that I am? Moses is welcomed into the royal family by the ancient Egyptian precision dance team, and one stock footage edit later, he and his adoptive brother Ramses are adults played by Val Kilmer and some other guy. They're eager young men who are slated to be the next leaders of the kingdom, but right now they just want to have a good time. What about some fun? Some starry desert nights? Nectar from the lotus, girls who flirt with smoky high. Dude, Ramses. These people literally think the sun rises and sets on you. I'm sure you could convince them to rustle up a couple hookers. 
Moses is also discontented because he's in love with the princess Nefertari and she with him, but she's betrothed to Ramses because he's going to be the next pharaoh. So she sings about how she'll always be in love with a man she can never have, and he sings about how he's all buttered about having to give way to his older brother. Does authority entitle us to indulge our every whim? Must I kneel before my brother now? Yesterday, I was just the same as him. This song is a bit of a miscalculation because it makes it seem like Moses' quest to liberate his people is rooted not in a sense of justice or a divine edict, but in his resentment at having to answer to one person in the entire damn kingdom. Grow up here already. But the real miscalculation is Val Kilmer himself. There is a world of difference between providing the voice of Moses in an animated movie and actually portraying him in a live stage production. Kilmer's singing is competent, but it lacks energy along with the rest of his performance. To illustrate, here is Moses right after he has suddenly and brutally murdered an Egyptian overseer. Would I change the future if I could just go back and stand on the threshold of one single act? Nothing will ever be the same. Here's Moses learning that everything he's believed about his life and family is a lie. You tell me I'm not who I am. Mother, then tell me who you think I am. Here he is having a life-changing spiritual experience. Why me? I just don't understand. Please tell me what I've ever done. Why you've chosen me to be the one to lead your people, set them free. And here he is standing up to mighty Pharaoh for his people. Let them go. Let my people go free. Let their free will decide what their lives are gonna be. Moses is one of the most significant figures in the Abrahamic tradition, and as such needs a certain charisma and inner fire in order to be convincing. Kilmer doesn't look like he could lead an accounting department meeting, much less a nation out of bondage. The plight of the still-in-bondage Hebrews is given voice by Joshua, played by Adam, that one guy from American Idol, no not him, the other guy, Lambert. He sings Is Anybody There, which is one of the few songs in the entire score to have any character to it. The lyrics are as meh as they are everywhere else, but the insistent drumbeat underscoring this desperate plea to the heavens gives the song both a sense of anguish and determination. This is a rare moment where the production almost reaches for the scope and passion of the material. At least until the end, when the pop rock showboating comes out in full force. Seriously, is he singing or preparing for a throat culture? Joshua is beaten for over-ornamenting the passage, allowing Moses to... Whoa! That was brutal! I mean, he doesn't even have any stake in the Hebrews at the moment, and he just goes and stabs the first overseer he comes across. That is one psychotic prophet. Moses is condemned to death for the crime, and hey, good job to the Egyptians for not letting his position protect him. Really, for an oppressive regime, that's very egalitarian. Hearing of their brother's plight, Aaron and Miriam decide it's time the truth of Moses' heritage be revealed. Yeah, the big moment when Moses discovers he's the son of slaves and the events surrounding it are badly written. There's no reason to believe this secret coming out now will do him any good, and every reason to believe it will only make matters worse. Yokovet even says as much. Truth can But of course it does come out, and as a result, Seti sends him into exile? Wait, he was all set to execute a prince of Egypt, so why give this interloper a chance of survival regardless of how slim? There's no logical progression to the action here. And then, as Moses is cast out into the wilderness, the ballads start. First, Bithya sings how she feels about all this. Then Moses sings about how he feels about all this. I should be grieving, but my heart is light. And I should be doubting, but I'm a rock inside. Then the Israelites sing about how they feel about all this. Oh, 
And then Nefertari sings, oh, you get the idea. The musical spends at least as much time on people reacting to the plot as it does on actual plot, which is where sin number five comes in. This production obviously expects the audience already knows this story, either from the Bible or from the classic Cecil B. DeMille movie. And yeah, that's a pretty safe bet. But even when you're telling a story everyone's heard already, you still need to tell it in a way that's interesting and involving. Instead, this version kind of skims over the important plot points, followed by long solos loosely tied to the characters' emotional states. It's hard to get into the story, and as a result, it's hard to really get to know the characters and feel for them. I mean, I had to look up the Wikipedia synopsis to remind myself of the names of some of these people. That's not very good storytelling. This wouldn't be as big of an issue if it weren't for the score. It's an accepted convention of the musical that every so often it will take some time to let a character sing their inner thoughts out, but the expectation is that the music will be worth listening to. Nobody complains about having to sit through soliloquy or back to before because they're awesome songs. Patrick Leonard and Maribeth Derry's score for the Ten Commandments is one nondescript pop song after another, punctuated by some laughable attempts to sound Middle Eastern. Now, mixing folk and modern techniques can yield amazing results. But this... Sounds like a drunk oboe player wandered into a nightclub. This crime against musical fusion is a showcase for Zipporah, who some of you may know is destined to become Moses' wife. Apparently she knows it too, because right after her one song declaring he's the one, they're getting married. And one scene after that, Moses is coming face to face with the famous burning bush. I have heard the cry of my children in Egypt. I will send you to bring my people forth out of bondage. That's not the Almighty, it's a Dalek. I'm not some vessel for your crazy plan to lead your desolate crying children to the land of milk and honey. Do not blaspheme! Do not blaspheme! Moses accepts this divine command with only a token amount of musical angst, which is lucky because his brother Aaron has just shown up to fetch him back to Egypt. I guess when there's a literal deus involved, you can ex machina all you want. Aaron informs Moses that Seti has died, and Ramses now rules with an iron fist and a cheesy villain song. I am his majesty, favorite of the gods. I am the glory. They all praise the glory of a Ramses is quite happy when his wayward brother turns up. I guess that whole exile on pain of death issue doesn't need resolving or anything, but is less than pleased to learn Moses is there on business. It's no man's right to enslave another man, to make him a possession, chain his heart, chain his hands. It's not your right to kill anyone's dreams. Moses is sounding a lot more like Martin Luther King Jr. than I remember. But Ramses isn't impressed by Moses' shadow puppets and doubles the slave's workload. The Ten Plagues ensue, which is one of the most memorable sequences in the entire narrative, and it should come as no surprise that this musical whiffs it entirely. None of the effects either on stage or added afterwards have been spectacular, but the projections for the plagues are a whole new level of amusing awfulness. I didn't realize De Vry graduates were a plague of Egypt. While that's going on, Moses and Ramses sing back and forth at each other, which just amounts to a whole bunch of LET MY PEOPLE GO! NO I WILL NOT LET THEM GO! LET THEM GO! NO I WILL NOT LET THEM GO! Duck season! Wabbit season! Duck season! Wabbit season! All this ends, as it must, with the Passover and the death of the firstborn Egyptians. Moses' look of genuine regret as he unleashes this calamity kind of loses something when you see how smug he is in the aftermath. Take your people and go. Your Pharaoh sets you free. No, brother. Not Pharaoh. The strong arm of God Almighty. Guess we showed you who's boss, huh? I'll, um, I'll just leave you to grieve in peace. 
Having gained their freedom and established one of their major holidays in the process, the Israelites are feeling mighty good about themselves. Well, there's something you didn't hear in the King James Version. I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This show doesn't need me, it needs a riff tracks. As the Hebrews begin their trek into the Target Photo Studio backdrop, Ramses mourns his loss, and we all know what that means. Is this the mighty king? Has he become this pale, pathetic, wasted thing? Uh, it means Nefertari gets a vampy villain song? Yes, Nefertari convinces her husband to unleash his army with Sin Number 7, Do That For Me. Leaving aside the unpleasant attempt to pin the problems of Ramses and Moses' dysfunctional bromance on a woman, this song comes out of nowhere. In the DeMille movie, Nefertari is well established as a scheming, manipulative minx, but here she hasn't done anything but mope about her doomed love for Moses. She's more Eponine than Matahari. We haven't seen anything to suggest she's capable of this level of vindictiveness. Although she did lose her son because her husband got into the whole my god is bigger than your god pissing contest, so she does kind of have a right to be upset. The CGI army of Egypt advances on the Israelites on the banks of the CGI Red Sea, and what do you want to bet whatever lame practical effect the stage version uses for this part is covered by even more lame video effects. Of course. And of course, after having the entire Red Sea dumped on his head, Ramses crawls out with nothing worse than a mild cough and gets a tender parting duet with Moses. Lord of Darkness, help me! I am not making any of this up. But how do I see you as my enemy? My memory makes my will go weak, and a voice inside repeats and repeats. How can this be? How can this be? I'm not sure what would be funnier that the writers didn't recognize the hoyetastic implications of this duet involving one of the great biblical patriarchs, or that they did realize it. Moses, your God, is God. Take care. Sorry about the whole enslavement thing. No problem, bro. Sorry about your kid and all. Eh, don't sweat it. There's 86 more where that came from. Moses goes up the mount, uh, the fake stone steps to seek a sign from above, while below the Israelites get restless. And since we're stuck listening to a pseudo-spiritual ballad by the female leads, so am I. Come on, let's see some good old-fashioned idolatry already. Well, that's a little better. I mean, it kind of looks like a porno directed by Bob Fosse, only not that awesome, but it's a start. The descent into mild misbehaving culminates with the arrival of the goal, uh, paper mache cap. Moses and his radioactive armpits are not pleased. How could you be so weak? You've given in to lust and greed. You kids are so grounded! But Moses' hissy fit is calmed when a boy soprano reassembles and reads the tablets. Somehow, this makes everything all right, and the commandments are put into the Ark of the Covenant so they can kick the Nazis' ass in a few thousand years. And the production concludes with sin number eight, Say a Prayer. Not only does this song extend the show's generous amount of ending fatigue, it doesn't really fit the mood of what we've just seen. When the armor we wear is all stripped away, beyond right and wrong, we're all the same. There are Bible stories you could wrap up with this kind of uplifting spiritual message, but this just isn't one of them. Exodus has so much Old Testament wrath of God in it that getting all touchy-feely at the end just doesn't work. It's probably the most awkward attempt to end a story of pain, suffering, and death on a positive note that I've seen, and I dealt with Rent recently. I will say that the absurdly happy curtain call does put a smile on my face, 
Although, like the rest of the musical, it's not for the reason they had in mind. The Ten Commandments is the kind of bad movie that bad movie lovers live for. It has such high ambitions and falls so short of them that it almost invites you to laugh and make snide comments at the action. Even though it fails at its intended goal, it's at least entertaining, which is a lot more than I can say for a lot of the cases I've dealt with. I'm tempted to go easy on it just for the sake of that. But what fun would that be? The Court of Musical Hell orders the following punishments. For the cringe-worthy post-production effects, we condemn Sean Esposito to be trapped in one of those terrible direct-to-video animated mockbusters. For the lack of coherent and meaningful narrative, we condemn Ali, however you pronounce it, and Albert Cohen to be left in an isolated location with directions back home that are only half complete and take several pointless detours. And for his uninspired performance, we condemn Val Kilmer to feature in the follow-up to the Kathy Ireland game. Dull surprise, dull surprise, yes, dull yes, surprise, yes, yes, dull yes, surprise. Yes. So let it be written, so let it be done. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned.